So let's pick up with talking about the, the, main, the main power players, if you will, um, going into World War II. Uh, you've got Russia. Um, the Russian Revolution, of course, had kicked in. Um, and there's far more to this. I mean, again, I'm just barely touching the surface. Um, the big thing that I want you to understand is um, that you have this, this very, you have a Soviet Union that's in the midst of a great deal of changes. Um, that's really struggling to find kind of a balance. Um, the 1920s, you know, the Russian Revolution is 1917. The Bolsheviks don't take over till October. Um, so really from, you know, 1918 until you get to about 1921, you have a, a civil war that's very bloody and very destabilizing. So it's not until you have about 21 to about, you know, 1930 um, that you start to see the Bolshevik slash Communist Party really in control. And that's going to be rocked by Vladimir Lenin and his death about 1924. And then you're going to have an internal power struggle. So again, it's very, very messy. So it's not until the 1930s that the Soviet Union really begins to, um, to, to kind of hit a stride, if you will. Um, the big thing is that Joseph Stalin emerges as the leader. Um, and Joseph Stalin comes up with these different five-year plan, five plans and all this kind of stuff of industrialization and agricultural advancement and all this kind of stuff where he basically dictates, okay, this area is going to make wheat and this area is going to make this. And, and anyways, the, the, the whole gist of it is it turns into a mess, right? Um, you know, like this is one of the things about communism that people criticize, which is that because the state is trying to plan all of this, um, they don't allow market forces to kind of prevail. And so you have areas where there's not enough of something and there's too much of something else and they're setting prices and it's just a big mess. One of the big things that you need to realize um, is that Joseph Stalin kills about 10 million of his own people. Um, and again, this is of his own people. I'm not even including in this, you know, political dissidents or World War II prisoners or any of that stuff, Okay. Um, Stalin, if you're talking about sheer numbers of people that were murdered, um, Stalin kills a lot of people. Um, yeah. Um, and he does this because people starve, people who refuse to cooperate get killed. Um, you know, lots of conditions going into that. So Joseph Stalin is, um, not a nice guy. Um, and again, you know, it's all about this idea of industrialization. Now, the Soviet Union was horribly behind industrially. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why you see um, him being very, uh, you know, him really pushing this um, because he wants the uh, United States, the Soviet Union, um, to be ready to, to handle whatever gets thrown at them. Um, you know, that they're still kind of being shaped by their anxieties from World War I and Germany trying to attack and all that kind of stuff. Um, so understand this is the Soviet Union. Stalin is very distrustful. Um, he is a, a sneaky guy. Um, you just need to kind of have that in mind because this is going to be, um, of course, this is Lenin right here, the, these two pictures. This is Stalin right here. Um, Stalin is, again, he's going to be the, the main nemesis of the United States. Um, we'll be allies throughout World War II because we share the common enemy of the Axis. Um, and, but you'll see that by the time you get to 1945, he's becoming far less cooperative. Um, very clearly was willing to use Soviet, or Soviet, American cooperation or cooperation with America, um, in order to defeat Germany from the Soviet Union. Um, but what's the Soviet Union say if he doesn't seem to have a whole lot of interest, um, and doing what he's supposed to do and you can't really trust him. And there's historians question all the time whether, you know, had FDR not died, if there might have been a different relationship. I doubt it. I think Stalin was just not a good guy. But um, so that so you also, you can't talk about fascism if you don't talk about Italy. Um, Benito Mussolini comes in. He actually founds the fascist party first, kind of refines this idea of fascism, um, comes in, takes over, um, becomes El Duce in 1922. He gets overthrown before the end of the war. Um, and Mussolini's kind of a mess. Um, he comes in, really kind of wears out the goodwill of the Italian people. They get pretty tired of all this militarism. Um, and there's a whole lot more information about Mussolini. Um, part of what he does is he tries to invade Ethiopia. 
tries to create this new Roman Empire and all this kind of stuff. And so the Italian people, it just wears out pretty quickly. Um, he also was not the best leader. Like, he was a great spokesman. He knew how to kind of make a speech and all that kind of stuff. But as far as effective governance, I don't think he was particularly good at that. Um, but, you know, he makes friends with Germany. And what's interesting is probably this relationship between Germany and Italy is is one of the weaknesses of Germany by the time you get to 1943 and 44, because they keep having to prop up Italy in order to protect that kind of uh, southwestern corner of Germany from invasion. Um, and so this is one of the one of the issues that you see there. And of course, if you remember back to World War One, Italy was always kind of flirting with which side they wanted to be friendly with. Um, and so you just need to recognize Mussolini's name, recognize him as fascist. Um, and know that, you know, there's, there's more to that story, but, you know, that's a world history approach. Um, Germany understand that post-World War I conditions, uh, Versailles Treaty, creates massive, you know, starvation and, and economic problems. And you've got all these unemployed soldiers from World War I. Um, you've got a brand new democracy with the Weimar Republic. Um, all kinds of problems going into the creation of Germany um, after World War I. And so it's into this, of course, you'll have Hitler um, in 1923. Of course, he had served in World War I. Um, 1923, he starts to buy into this fascist idea. Um, and he believes, he kind of formulates this, this uh, National Socialist Workers' Party. Um, and, of course, to what extent they were actually a very viable party in 1923. Um, there's a lot of, there, there's some evidence, maybe not a lot of evidence, but there's some evidence that they kind of doctored their own registra registration roles, um, so they weren't nearly as big as people thought they were. Um, nevertheless, he decides that he's going to orchestrate a coup because the Weimar Republic is so kind of struggling with everything, and there's all these attacks from... All these different groups and people that want to replace the monarchy, people that want communism, peace, kind of democratic, liberal people that are kind of in the middle. Um, and so he basically says, you know, we're going to in instigate a coup. Um, so he gets a group of followers. They go into the into the Munich uh, City Hall. This is called the Beer Hall Putsch. Um, gets very quickly arrested. This turns into nothing. And this is why he gets thrown into jail. Um, and it's in jail that he'll write the Mein Kampf book. Um, where he kind of pulls out this myth mythology about the Aryan superiority. There's a heavy dose of kind of this eugenics, this kind of, you know, misapplication of genetic studies, if you will, um, that we've talked about before and talking about progressives and kind of this emerging field of genetic science um, that was still in its infancy at this point. Um, so he writes Mein Kampf, comes out, um, again, doesn't seem to be this really viable candidate, right? So he's, he's released from jail by like 1925, 26. Um, and he starts kind of, you know, campaigning. They start kind of reaching out. Um, he makes some, some friends with, I believe it's, uh, you know, Goebbels and, Hit and Himmler and a guy by the name of Ernst Rahm who's kind of with the brown shirts. And they use these brown shirts, the SA, um, to really kind of strong arm people. Like they pick fights with communists and they create intentional instability. Um, you know, we're used to people making accusations about paid protesters and all that kind of stuff these days. Um, that's the kind of thing that the SA did, right? They would go into some place and create havoc and, and kind of disruptions to make the Weimar Republic look weaker than it really was um, and to really kind of create some problems there. Um, and, you know, and, and so that's one of the things. And, then it, and some of it wasn't even that they went in to make it look that way. Sometimes they were just there and you would have these fights that would erupt, um, you know, very much in the same way you see some of these, you know, when you get two different groups of protesters together. Um, there doesn't seem to be a, you know, there, there wasn't a, a desire to have an actual conversation about policy, if you will. Um, so what you have is that many Germans, by the time he starts to gain some traction and the Nazi party starts to win more and more seats in the German parliament of the Reichstag, what will happen is that many Germans uh, will kind of look at Hitler as being, you know, at least he's got an answer. Um, at least, you know, maybe maybe he can get control of the communist elements because many Germans um, were uncomfortable, especially your middle class and upper class Germans, were uncomfortable with the notion of communism. Uh, and so they hoped that they could kind of keep that in line, and they hoped that that really Hitler's rhetoric did not 
was not as extreme as he made it sound, that the extremism was more of a, a campaign tactic. Um, and so, the, you know, many people will support him. He'll get elected in the Reichstag by 1932. The Nazis are in control. Um, and so what will happen is that by, I think by 34, um, Hindenburg has died. And next thing you know, he's installed as Fuhrer. Um, this happens 34, 35. Uh, 1936 is the Berlin Olympics, then you start having this pressure for appeasement. So this all begins to happen very, very quickly after he gets out of jail. Um, and this is how he comes into power. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that he was elected democratically. Um, and, you know, that there was also kind of this acquiescence among the German people that, um, well, you know, he doesn't really mean the things he says. Um, or, well, yes, I know he wrote this book, Mein Kampf, but that may not mean exactly, you know, like that's just his ideas. And, you know, when he gets down to governing, it won't be quite the same way. Um, so you can see why people make these some, some of these comparisons with today. Um, I don't think it's exactly fair. Um, first off, the conditions in Germany are unique. Um, and you cannot escape from the, the rise of Hitler, the inexperience with democracy. Um, that, you know, clearly does not apply to today. Um, so I think there's there's issues, there's some disingenuity um, if you try to compare today's politics with 1930s Germany. Um, but I do think it's important to recognize the, the role of democracy and putting um, not good people into power. Um, I also think it's important to realize that many times people assume kind of an apathy or a, well, we'll just, you know, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, uh, and then it turns out not being fine. And then the problem with Hitler was by the time people realized in 30, really beginning as early as 35, 36, in small pockets of community um, around Germany, but definitely by the time you get to 1938, um, by the time this begins to really coalesce and people are like, whoa, wait a minute, the, you know, what's happened? Um, it's too late. <laughs> you know, the, Hitler's in charge, he's the Fuhrer, um, his stormtroopers, his SA, um, which will ultimately be replaced by the SS. There's a whole another Nazi history aspect of that. Um, when that begins to take place, that you don't question the government, uh, and not with your not unless you're willing to risk your livelihood and your family. And this is the thing about you know, about these this kind of tyrant is you know, the, the time to speak up against tyranny is before it gets ensconced in power or before it solidifies its power base. Once that's happened, um, it's very difficult to do because the reality is most of us will take care of our family um, before we take care of anything else. Um, so the time to quibble over um, political disagreements is when there's still an opportunity to do so. And unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Um, again, there's a whole lot of his Nazi history in here, the burning of the Reichstag that clearly gets manipulated by the Nazis to look like it's the Communist Party. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, so pictures of Hitler, which we're all pretty familiar with. Um, one quick note, because I'm coming up on 13 minutes here. Um, one quick note, Spain, uh, Spain has a civil war in the 1930s, um, kind of a similar kind of... But everything falls apart and you've got communists fighting fascists and you've got democratic, you know, liberals. And so you've got this huge range. Everyone's fighting against each other. And I mentioned Spain because Spain is going to be what I would call a proxy war um, with Stalin and the Communist Party helping the Spanish communists, with Hitler um, helping the Spanish phalangists, the, the basically the, um, the fascist party. Um, and so you're going to have this division. If you're familiar with, um, oh, and I can't think of the artist's name. Um, starts with the G. Is it Gre Greco or something? Anyways, um, it, his artwork from the Spanish Civil War is particularly telling um, and violent, and you know shows you kind of what the the outcome um, of that kind of fighting is. And you really begin to see if you want a precursor of what World War II is going to look like if you look at the Spanish Civil War. Now America stayed out of it. Um, because we were, we were, of course, neutral, um, understand that it's in 1937 that we have n neutrality acts getting passed and we, we start tweaking the notion of neutrality so we can start to help different groups um, and start to help the Spanish who, 
you know, are fighting a civil war so we can help the Chinese who are fighting the Japanese. So our neutrality policy is going to be tweaked and nudged by these conflicts with Spain and China. Um, but most telling, it's going to be the power that it's going to give to Germany. Um, Germany is going to use this kind of assistance um, to Spain as a justification to um, strengthen their own military. And this is when you begin to see um, Hitler really thwarting the Treaty of Versailles as far as military buildup. And so that's kind of what the role of Spain is. Um, reality is Texas is not going to ask you about Spain. Um, the most Texas is going to ask you about is kind of the role of um, fascism and communism, kind of the rise of totalitarian dictatorships. Um, so that's what the state of Texas focus is going to be. Um, but I want to be sure you have kind of a working understanding of some of this. Um, so Japan, uh, long heritage of military control, cultural superiority. We've talked about that before. Remember, at, you know, when the U.S. began to have a relationship with them, um, they had been isolationist, like hadn't allowed foreign influence in at all. Um, until the U.S. basically comes in and forces their way. And then Japan goes through this very rapid industrialization process, which is one of the reasons why by 1931 and 32 you're starting to see increasing Japanese uh, territorial aggression. Really, you can go back to 1905. Um, because that's when they begin to have a conflict with Russia. This is when you're going to start to see the dominoes begin to fall for um, the rise of the Bolshevik Party because the defeat in the 1905 Russo-Japanese War that Teddy Roosevelt negotiated a peace to and won the Nobel Peace Prize for, um, that's going to be something that triggers the downfall of the Russian Tsar, uh, begins to create the circumstances that lead to the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, it's also going to lead to a very aggressive Japanese uh, military um, that begins to feel like they can push through these, these decisive victories. Um, and one of the things that you'll see happening too after World War I is Japan's interests are largely ignored, and that's going to make them pretty mad because they need resources, right? Um, so again, they're going to invade Manchuria and Korea by 1937. Um, there's some pretty terrible genocide in Nanking um, where they basically slaughter people, um, you know, beheading contests with men. They throw babies out of windows and bash their heads in and drown them. Um, you know, basically chaining women to beds so that they can be used by soldiers. Um, lots of really horrific, horrific stories. Um, it's referred to as the rape of Nanking because it's so violent. Now, um, you know, one of the issues is we don't often hear about the hear about the Japanese uh, genocide in China, in part because first off, the Japanese don't keep records of it. Um, they there were contests in which the newspapers documented that, um, so we do have some idea. But that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface because they didn't keep paperwork the way the Germans did with the Holocaust. Um, largely because they saw anybody else other than Japanese as, as subhuman. Um, and so the Chinese were subhuman. Why worry about keeping records about how many of them they killed? It just mattered that they killed them. Um, so they didn't worry about women and children and that kind of thing. Um, so, um, so that's one reason we don't know. And the other reason, too, is if you remember that map um, of, of China, Japan is engaged in trying to maintain control of China. Um, unlike Germany that's able to control Poland and France and these areas where they have solidified control, um, Japan is struggling to get control of China. China is massive, right? Um, and so they're having this real struggle there. Um, and so they, they aren't able to sit down and really develop a system by which they exploit and, and kill you know, millions of people. They do kill millions of people, uh, but they do so very unofficially, and it's, you know, lots of random acts of violence and that kind of thing. So um, just understand that this notion of, of genocide, we often hold up the Nazis and the Holocaust, and I'm not making light of the Holocaust by any stretch of the imagination. I just want you to understand that World War II is known for genocide. Um, genocide, whether it's Stalin, whether it's the Japanese and the Chinese, um, you know, there, there's lots of there's lots of bad stuff going around. I guess you could say um, the prime minister becomes largely he gets replaced um, and kind of knocked down because he's trying to resist the military control. And it really becomes about the emperor um, Hirohito. This is the emperor Hirohito and uh, General Admiral Tojo, um, who is the head of the military. 
Um, so that's really where the power structure is going to be. And that's why I say Japan is not a true fascist power because you don't have, yes, technically Hirohito is the emperor. Um, he's seen as a god. Um, but he's also a little bit removed from the military operations. So the military decisions are being made by Tojo. Um, now, there's some historians that argue Hirohito was much more closely aligned with the military. Um, and certainly we see after World War II, thanks to Douglas MacArthur, there's a great deal of remaking the legend of Hirohito into being somebody who was kind of haplessly drug along into what the military wanted to do. What is the true story? Um, probably something in the middle, uh, where Hirohito was kind of on board with a lot of it, especially at first. Um, by the time you get to 44 and 45, as Japan's clearly getting on the ropes, um, he's probably less convinced. Um, but unfortunately, his ability to stand up to the military was pretty weakened. Um, so just kind of understand that Japanese fascism is different because of this dual power structure that, that's there, um, as well as the fact that they are constantly fighting. Um, for them, they don't have that long period of kind of, long period, you know, five, six, seven years, where they kind of have control of things. So for them, it's a little bit of a different look and flavor, if you will. Um, and there's a number of nuances to the Axis powers. Um, again, first off, it's going to come in. Um, one of the big things are the Non-Aggression Pact in 1939. Um, so you're going to see um, that Germany and Italy agree to support each other. This has to do with Spain. So they're helping each other. So they become kind of partners pretty early on by 1937, 1938. Of course, this is helped as well by the kind of annexation of Austria and, and kind of these different territories that Hitler's demanding. Um, then he's going to sign a non-aggression pact with, uh, with Russia over Poland. Um, basically, they're going to, he kind of reveals to Russia that, hey, I'm going to, Russia, Soviet Union, that I'm going to invade Poland here pretty quick. And when I do so, you're welcome to invade from the other direction, from the, you know, from the east. And you can take your half and I'll take my half. And this can serve as a buffer zone. So basically, we'll take Poland and we'll divide it between the two of us. So that way, we're less likely to fight each other. Um, and so that's kind of what happens. Now, did, did Stalin really think Hitler was going to uphold this? I don't know. Probably not. Um, you know, but there's also some indication that maybe he kind of vaguely thought so. It, who knows? Certainly he was trying to buy time for the Soviet Union to kind of tool up and be, get more militarily strong. Um, you're going to see that by 1936, uh, Japan kind of joins with Italy and Germany in an anti common turn pact to initially share information about communism, remember Japan's proximity to Russia. Um, and that, that agreement in 36 will then morph into 1940. Um, as Germany is, you know, Germany by that point has already swept into Poland. They've divided Poland. The war's already begun. Uh, by 1940, Germany has pushed Britain out of France with uh, the Dunkirk rescue. Um, and you're going to see that Japan is clearly planning its attack on the United States. So they agree to become formal allies in 1940. So that's where the idea of the Axis powers comes from. Um, and a lot of this has to do with them kind of agreeing um, to do their own thing and not, not step on each other's toes while they fight these democratic powers and communist powers, if you will. Um, and, of course, for Japan, this means that they can start pushing towards India, start pushing towards Australia, and that kind of thing. So keep in mind American neutrality. Um, you have the Nye Committee in 34 blames uh, the Great Depression on World War I connections with the armament in industry. 1935, we say it's illegal to sell weapons to countries at war. No countries at war. If you're fighting, we're not going to sell you weapons. Okay, well, then why make weapons at all, right? Well, by 1937, we tweak that so that it's on a cash and carry basis. So that way, if you can pay for the weapons up front um, and pay cash and have your own shipping and all that kind of stuff, then we'll make the weapons and sell them to you. Um, so you're starting to see that, of course, to what extent the, the Roosevelt recession has. I, you know, who knows? You, you can speculate all you want. Um, so we start having these steps into kind of a global involvement. Now, Roosevelt in this whole system, um, Roosevelt was not an isolationist. Um, now, he was definitely more concerned with creating, with fixing the Great Depression. So he's not an isolationist, but in 1934, you know, 36, he's more concerned with the economy. 
Um, it, but he does see that ultimately we're going to need international trade. So he kind of has this idea of internationalism uh, that if I'm doing business with uh, with somebody, I'm far less likely to go to war with them, right? This was kind of one of the theories that you saw with the Treaty of Versailles and the 14 points. Um, but he also knows that Americans want to be neutral, that we don't want to get involved, especially by the time you get to 37 and 38, and things are really starting to heat up. Uh, Americans are like, yeah, no, we don't want to get involved. And of course, it's not helped that the State Department doesn't want to be involved either. I mean, you've got some internal politics kind of coming into play. Um, and so in 1937, Japan, when they launched their full-scale invasion of China, um, FDR will basically start to send weapons to China because he says, well, China's not in a declared war. They were attacked first. Um, and so what you see is by 37 and 38, and this coincides with kind of the decline of the New Deal, is FDR is starting to gradually respond to circumstances. Um, and this will only pick up as we get into 39 and get into 1940. Um, so, picture of FDR, this, this kind of shows you um, some key dates if you're interested in that. Um, so, this kind of takes you through the beginnings of World War II, um, kind of how we start getting into this tense situation.